Hello everyone, uh, so this is an Ari, and I'm tired, I've literally just recorded this and messed up the entire recording, uh, so I'm going to start again, but we're doing something a little different, uh, we're doing a tier list of leader abilities, now there is sort of gameplay stuff uh, coming in the next couple of weeks, but I just wanted to do something quick like this, well it was meant to be quick but this is getting on a little bit now after having to re-record, but I wanted to look at sort of each of the leaders and partially for myself as well just kind of objectively think about each of them and how good they are um, and I just quickly want to say like so we're on the same page about how I'm approaching these um, I'm trying to look at them as like firstly we'll sort of treat C as like baseline it's not terrible it's not great it's just it does something doesn't really synergize it's a whatever kind of leader ability um, so to make the example clearer, blood money's in there, and I'll talk about that one first. But that's the perfect example of like a C leader ability. Doesn't synergize with anything, it just gets your points. Uh, also, I'm sort of talking about this in sense of like how much support um, each faction provides for that leader. So, for example, like guerrilla tactics, rear movement, for example, how good that synergy actually is. Um, less looking at like meta decks and like right this is good now and they use this leader therefore it's good because then we're just replicating a meta tier list and then we just see shield wall uh rage of the sea and then what well, like precision strike it's just pointless because you can just you can just go on like tlg or like aratuza or whatever and look at a meta snapshot and it would be much the same as this so i just wanted to look at the leaders a bit more of a what potential they have really and i think it probably becomes a bit more clearer as i speak about it um and i'm sure people will disagree with probably everything i say uh which is fine but this is at least a good talking point i'll get my version out um i'll i'll figure out how to uh get a link to this in the description so you can sort of do your own um and then obviously in the comments tell me why i'm stupid and how you would change everything that i've said uh so this is probably going to take a little bit of time um i want to get this out relatively quickly not spend ages on each one um but there are still plenty to cover because obviously there's how many is there 36 leaders i think uh so yeah there's plenty to get through so uh blood money first was like like i said not too much to say it's eight points gives you a toll removal at any point and you can't really like lose value because you get the extra coins so it's like it's not good it's not bad it isn't synergizing with anything it just generally does one thing um and there's no real drawback to it so araka swarm i actually think is b uh purely because the passive is like okay like you have a passive that sorry one moment uh stuff was just going off um you have a passive ability Sorry, they're gonna cut their um, stuff pinging off. So you have a passive ability that gives you one point uh, whenever you play an organic. Typically the organics are okay. Um, and because of sort of cards that synergize with swarming um, and the ability to like consume cards and because it's an insectoid, there's a fair few insectoid synergy cards. There's a lot in place to work with Arrakis Swarm. Now, realistically all you're seeing are these like semi cheese lists that sort of run things like yen um to kind of buff all your swarm cards and then you play things like burn talisman and stuff like that which is a fine way to play but feels a little weird um but i think there's a lot of support there and arguably some of the support is pretty good and the bonus of being able to have an active that just builds upon that really leans heavily into that swarm archetype and because the support there for swarm i think it's it's generally a decent leader ability not like it's not here by any means but it's it's decent uh so blaze of glory blaze of glory's got to be in here so the reason for this is for one it's thinning which is never a bad thing uh two skellige has a lot of support for this kind of thing um unfortunately there was the loss of the sad loss, which we should all take a moment to mourn, of uh, Sacrificial Vanguard. 
so discard's kind of lost its like signature leader ability but skelliger definitely benefits from um sort of discarding cards and then bringing them back from the graveyard all that kind of thing and blaze of glory synergizes really well with that so when you think about cards like Seedrifter's right and the whole keep jutter in your deck use blaze of glory to deal 12 damage to something Seedrifter's right to get a 12 power unit out without the drawback um that's obviously a very powerful combo and Skellige in general has a lot of cards that have very high base uh, points but come down damaged so you think about things like Great Sword um, and like Veteran and obviously like Jutter um, so they synergize really nicely with Blaze of Glory because you can just take full advantage of that base power you don't have to worry about the damaged aspect you're getting the full value just from that base number alone so I think it, it lends very nicely to a sort of control kind of angle with Skellige, which at the moment there's plenty of opportunities for that. Uh, so next we have Bloodsent. And Bloodsent is like honestly between these two, uh, maybe even an E+. Plus. So I'd say an E+. Plus. So the kind of reasoning for this was, was, is. Um, like it is 11 points which is pretty decent when you compare it to something like blood money which is eight points max it's pretty good however bleeding isn't necessarily the same as just points and this is kind of because your opponent has a lot of counterplay to this like purifies consumes with the introduction of veil there's far less targets for bleeding um you need your opponent to be playing units that you are happy to be bleeding and yeah it's it just feels very awkward and even if you get this bleeding off there's not many cards that synergize too well like you would expect the vampire archetype to work super well with this this feels like it's made for the vampire archetype but you only really have like oriana and gale to really benefit from bleeding um your other vampires tend to just apply bleeding and not really do much with a bleeding unit uh, obviously you have things like Garkins, but yeah, there's not not too much good support for Bloodthirst. Uh, for Bloodthirst, for Blood Scent, sorry. So I think without that extra support, um, it's just not good enough purely because it's such slow tempo, um, you're really not getting a great payoff from it. So next we have Battle Trance, which is a, is a D. Um, my reasoning for this is like the active component is six points but it's semi-conditional because a unit has to be like four power or higher to be gaining you that six points um obviously onto something like a draco turtle or an armored dracar it's a bit more than six points but again that does lead to a more combo angle and you need to set it up and everything just trying to evaluate on what is doing like 90 percent of the time uh and I sort of spoke about this before. The healing is just kind of underwhelming. If it was boost a unit by one, probably quite good. But because it's it requires you to have damaged units on the board to then benefit from your alchemy cards, and the good alchemy cards are kind of limited. Like obviously you have things like Freya's Blessing, which are good. Um, Decoction's really good. Sigdrift is right in certain setups is really good but really alchemy cards are a little underwhelming so i'll sort of speak about this more when i got into nature's gift but the healing doesn't really do a whole lot and you're really not getting huge amounts from the passive uh, so then we have call of harmony which i think is an e like borderline f so i wanted this to be good because uh, i like harmony and I'm kind of glad it's in a healthy state at the moment, not like old Harmony was, because really that was only broken because of Mystic Echo. Um, the current state, I think it's quite good, but I think arguably the Dana that you get out, the active component, is just very underwhelming. So sure, it will always trigger Harmony because Skyatel can't trigger Harmony from Relics, any way but through Call of Harmony, which I think is quite nice. Um, it was quite a good idea for them to introduce something that's a guaranteed Harmony tag. But the problem with this is the card itself really isn't doing a whole lot. 
So if you compare it to, say for example, a Wandering Treon, for example, which is seven provisions, five power uh, Treon, and sure there are some Treon you'll play, but typically this will probably be the first one you play down. Um, it also has like dual purposes, can be poison, which is obviously very strong, or it can have a shield, which is obviously very good, even if you value that at one power, that would then make this like a six power unit, or it can like take one damage, steal poison, but you, you get the angle I'm taking. Um, so that basically makes Dana a six, maybe seven provision card, which is a little bit underwhelming. Um, I'm not sure what can really be done to this to make it any better i think i think just the removal of mystic echoes really highlighted that harmony wasn't the problem it was the double waters of broccolon that was the problem uh not the not harmony within itself uh so congregation congregation i think is an a like borderline s and the reason for this is because there's so much synergy now with it it's absolutely insane when you look at cards like Fallen Knight, all the new support for Fire Swarm, um, and also you think about cards like Horse and Senior, the way that can work with getting your use your three charges, flip two of them into lackeys, very, very good. Um, and also the way that Fire Swarm lends to swarming, allowing you to swarm with your leader ability is obviously very strong. And the extra coins are never a bad thing. So I think Although it's really only playing as like a 9 point leader ability, which isn't too bad. Like, in and of itself, it just makes it objectively better than blood money, um, in theory. But because there's so much synergy, I think it is very, very strong. I think it does deserve an A, like, maybe even pushing for us. Uh, so then we have Dead Eye Ambush. And Dead Eye Ambush is like kind of in between these two. Um, maybe even E. So my reasoning for this is 9 point leader ability, not bad. Uh, the set and elf synergies, which are great. Uh, can get your ailerin out, which is great. But the dead eye aspect itself is very underwhelming. Um, it only synergizes with Venossial. And Scoyotel can very easily swarm the board. And you will see this plenty of times where especially if you're playing like a very spy heavy nilf guard deck for example you can very easily fill their board to the point where they can't play anything and there are cards that will synergize with this so like great Irk, for example and obviously like eyes and grim really good to buff them all up but beyond that they're very disappointing um yeah i think i think there's really not much more to say than that than there's not a huge amount of synergy with it and yeah, I think in general, Scoyotel leader abilities aren't really that strong. Uh, so this is probably like the first one, I guess, people are probably going to question. But I would put a Double Cross at A. So the reason for this isn't really the points associated with it. It's, it's more like in terms of how card games work in general. Um, double Cross, in effect, gives you information that you would never normally get and it is unbelievably valuable so i don't think i'm ever going to get pushed back when i say that stream sniping is a bad thing and it gives you an incredibly unfair advantage and double cross basically works like stream sniping does it gives you information that allows you to make plays you could never make without that information and this is obviously not as powerful at lower ranks where people are playing a wide wide range of decks um, and you're not sure what you're going to run into. But when you're playing against meta decks and you know for certain they have these three cards and you know their sort of reach point wise, especially if you're playing it when they have three cards left in hand, you know exactly what they have and you can plan your future turns based around what they have. For example, you're playing against Skellige, you use your leader ability, see that they have a Mark Varg. So. That means you're probably not going to play your Joachim, for example. You're going to hold it for a later round. Or you're going to try and bait out the Markvag before you play Joachim. And that kind of information you can normally only get through making very, very good reads on the way your opponent's playing. Or through stream sniping. And that information is just incredibly powerful. So for that reason, I think it's it's A. Uh, so Enslave, I think is E. 
maybe even F. No, I think it, it does actually deserve F, in fairness. Um, so this is because most leader abilities synergize with what you're doing and make your cards better. So things like Congregation, for example, make your Fallen Knights better. Um, Enslave kind of works in the opposite way. You have to play bad cards to make Enslave playable. Uh, so that's kind of why Enslave 6 or Enslave 5, for example, you're going to see things like Battle Prep and uh, you're going to see things like Assassination, which are all right. But what it leads to is you have to build your deck in a certain way using very suboptimal cards to make a leader ability that really isn't that strong be actual, actually usable. Um, especially when you consider, for example, um, Enslave 5 requires you to run... I'm very dumb. I think it's 12. Is it 12? I think it's 12, um, 12 tactics, but I could be wrong on that. I'm pretty sure I am wrong. Um, but you know what I'm talking about. It requires you to run quite a few um, tactics. And sure, you have good tactic cards. Things like Joust are okay. Uh, Bribery is obviously good. Um, Council is really good. Like Marching Orders is okay in certain decks. But everything else is kind of subpar. And you need to run that just for Enslave to work. And Enslave even then is like very underwhelming. So yeah, for that reason, I I actually think it's arguably one of the worst leader abilities. Uh, so then we have Force of Nature, which again, I think is an F. And I think that's because it's super janky. Uh, so the reason for this is this works really well in a Thrive deck, or if you're trying to benefit from Thrive. But what we've kind of seen is Thrive is very good for securing round one or using like... Um, like card advantage punish that sort of thing in a round one to play things like a drag lava then like a brooksor or something maybe use frost to get winter queen out and all of a sudden you play something like a noon wraith which would be six points but then because you have those four thrive engines on the board it was a 10 point play and it just really ups the tempo on all your players now that means that force of nature would be very very good to play in round one trigger all your thrives comes down for a huge amount of points however playing out your leader just to win round one is like nearly always a bad idea because you then lack power going into later rounds and your opponent can capitalize if they still have their leader left because they just have three points um and what this results in is then like in round three for example you're rarely relying on thrive um typically what you tend to see is thrive used as like a a way to squeeze out the early rounds to then get to the end rounds and play your big stuff so things like Horn and Auburn and play your Osra last say all that kind of stuff and then all it represents is a nine power body just coming down which is yeah a little little underwhelming uh so fruits of you use gif is B plus I'd say it's definitely better than Araka Swarm uh but I think A would be a bit of a push. And this is kind of because of what it represents. Um, I think if Fruits was sort of play it, you get to play it like once a round, it would be E, maybe even F. Or if it had charges, it would probably be E or F. But the kind of dynamic that it sets up is really interesting in that you can play a unit that is an engine because it's thrive you can keep playing units and it's just going to get taller but at the same time your opponent really doesn't want to remove it because they know you will just be able to start it over again so there's you basically have access to an engine that can never be shut down um and not to mention it has synergy with things like consume uh like self-damaging things uh like self-destruction stuff so what you really get is a card that makes all your other cards just that little bit better and just adds adds points here and there and because you can use it every single round no issues there it provides a lot of points that your opponent is hesitant to stop you ever doing now when ethereal was about obviously this was absolutely insane because you could just keep 
chaining off ethereals but even without it um it definitely has a lot of power and it just it doesn't really need any support to be good which i think is much like i was saying with double cross it it can just be used and it will always provide you points you don't really need to work around it uh, so guerrilla tactics uh, honestly is like an f uh, so the reason for this is row movement rarely matters all that much um typically if the meta shifts to a point where there's a lot of row lock stuff you maybe see people running uh, stuff like drowners um or like hammond was sometimes played in skellige so sort of that sort of thing like one piece of row movement um but what this results in is like you've got leader ability that plays for six points moves things on rows which really isn't that great and there's not huge uh payoffs for skyotel for row movement they've tried to get it going so things like sentinel come to mind but they're just not enough they don't give you enough points to really justify um row movement in general it's just not that good uh so next we have hidden cash um, I think Hidden Cash is a B, purely because there are a lot of good hard cards. So you think about cards like Sol and like uh, Von Hurst and obviously like Passiflora Peaches, all that kind of stuff that really benefit from the reduced hard. Now we kind of saw this and sort of how thin the line is between balanced and broken in that when the reduction on hard was 3, Hidden Cash was insane um, and now that it's 2, it's it's balanced it's like a good leader ability um that synergizes really nicely with what syndicate's looking to do with setting up engines and that sort of thing uh so i think it's in a very healthy spot i wouldn't put it c because i don't think it's like middle of the pack i think it's a little bit above that as uh, so imperial formation i think at the moment it's a d uh so the reason for this is like it's not really providing all that much um when it was like four charges, like fair enough, it was eight points, is is still decent. Always works and you can use it to put a soldier on top of your deck. Um obviously straight away people realise, wow, that works really well with Af Afan. You put Afan on top and it's a big swing of points. But it does mean you are then spending uh, I always forget the price of Afan, it's either eight or nine provisions to get your leader ability to work and eight or nine provisions is quite expensive and it's really not providing all that much i think after losing those two points it was just enough to push it from that point where it was like a pretty good leader to just not really doing it not enough power uh so yeah a bit disappointing but i think it deserves d uh so we have imposter Honestly, I think imposters an A. Uh, this is like kind of the growing trend. Is like Nilfgaard has a lot of good leader abilities, but because Nilfgaard is quite weak on its own and doesn't have all that great synergy with leader abilities, um, that's kind of why Nilfgaard isn't played all that much. But the leader abilities, like in a vacuum, are really really strong. Um, so imposter is so so good because you can use it to shut down engines and not only does it shut down an engine it also gives you that engine yourself so say you play this against northern realms for example you use it to lock an anna you get your own anna that is boosted so we'll trigger straight away use it against skellige you take like an anchor at longship or something um really really strong and it has a lot of uses and if nothing else, you're locking a unit up, and we all kind of know there's synergies for Nilfgaard with locks. Obviously, you have uh, things like Thirsty Dames that benefit from it. They've even got like the four power engines, like uh, the Master of Secrets. Pretty sure it's called Master of Secrets. I haven't played that kind in a long time. But you know the one, the one that boosts if uh, your opponent's got a locked unit. Um, and you've got Slave Driver, so cards that synergize with locks. And the obvious ones like uh, Vanamar, and I have completely forgotten the name of uh, Vatia. <laughs> Nearly forgot the name uh, Vatia that lets you seize a locked locked unit. Uh, you you can then play your leader ability, 
not only lock their engine, which then gives them a chance to like purify it or anything like that, you can then just play a Vanamar straight away to kill it. And that combo included with the fact you could play like a Vatier, play Vatier, it comes to your turn, your opponent hasn't removed it, so you lock up a unit, Vatier to seize it, you've also got your version, um, is very, very strong. So imprisonment, despite what I was just saying about lock synergies, um, is probably like a D, maybe even E. Um, I will be a little more generous and say D, mainly because this is basically two Nilfgaard stratagems. Just not, not good. Not good. Nilfgaard's already got ways to deal with um, engines. The different, the like huge difference between this and uh, Imposter is Imposter's generating U value as well. It's not just stopping your opponent's value and three points of damage. It's actively generating you a unit as well. So yeah, I think it's very, very strong because, and I didn't mention this with Imposter, completely forgot, but even if you're not shutting down an engine, you can play this on a tall unit and it will do much the same. Say your opponent's got a Goliath, lock up a Goliath, you get a 12 point Goliath. Like, so much value to be had. Whereas Imprisonment is just very, very linear and isn't really providing all that much. Uh, so then we have Invigorate. And like, I really want Invigorate to be good, but it's F. And I think every piece of data kind of shows why. Um, it's really because it's just not doing anything. It's one of the lowest tempo things you can do. And all it's really providing you is one point extra on your cards. At absolute best, it's 10 points. And that is if you have only units in your hand and you play it on a full hand. 10 points is like the ceiling for this card. The absolute ceiling. And that's just not good. And it would be acceptable. I say acceptable, it's like I'm trying to justify it as a leader ability. Uh, but it would be playable if there were more cards that benefit from hand buff. But there really aren't. Uh, obviously like Sheldon Skag sees a bit of play, but... Beyond that, there's nothing really else. Um, obviously, I nearly forgot. Nearly forgot a glaze. There's obviously a glaze. Um, but even then, you want a glaze in deck for to use Isengrim's Council on it, so you're probably not even bothered about Invigorate. Yeah, the, just hand buff isn't good. As much as I would love hand buff to be good, because I would absolutely jump at the chance to play a hand buff Skytel. That sounds really fun, but it's just so bad you would never enjoy it. <laughs> Uh, so then we have good old zeal which i think is a and this is kind of because uh probably a bit of a spoiler for what's coming up but much the same as with overwhelming hunger um it does much the same job where there's a lot of cards that are balanced in the way that they have order abilities but they don't have zeal in order to kind of limit their ability uh because your opponent hasn't has like a chance to counterplay it uh, they're not as good however zeal just removes that um and obviously at the moment we only really see like blue striped de uh decks which are arguably a little bit of a meme um but when you consider cards like how good like Visigod was before you can give him zeal now um cards like selkirk i mean cards like ildico are played in shield wall just to give selkirk zeal and like siege support is played in uh, shield wall just to give zeal to this one specific card, and this leader ability does that three times and boosts by two. So uh, yeah, inspired zeal really really good. Doesn't see much play now, but I think arguably that's just because shield wall exists and uprising exists, and they're just so much better. But I don't think it's I don't think it's uh, inspired zeal's fault that it's not played i think it's just there's better options but it doesn't take away from its individual power as uh, sir so i am so bad at uh syndicate leaders because i don't play them but if i get uh any of these wrong you can take the piss all you like in uh in comments but anyway jackpot pretty sure this is jackpot um jackpot's a c it's much the same as like uh Blood money where it gets your coins, there's no way to like lose value on it, it's just a few points, it's really nothing to write home about, no huge synergies, it's just uh, eh. Uh, so lockdown, 
and probably hate me for this, but lockdown's S. So the reason lockdown is S is it gives you the potential to just win games outright. So this is kind of because a lot of decks rely on their leader ability and are built around what their leader ability does. So like I was saying about Blaze of Glory, keeping a Jutterin deck to then discard it and then Sigdruff is right it. Can't do that anymore. So your entire deck plan, like that section is useless. Uh, hidden Cash, you've played a lot of Horde cards that are arguably not that good. But with uh, Hidden Cash, it makes the Horde lower. They're quite good. So things like Passive Flora Peaches, uh, Von Hurst. Now the Hordes are back to normal and you have a lot of cards that are like subpar. And I can go on and on and on. There's plenty uh, of Woman Hunger, for example. That's really good because you can, you know, make your Death Wish cards go off when the only reason they're balanced is because they can't go off on the first turn without setup that is uh, and you stop that so it has so much counterplay and you don't really need to build around it at all and there's kind of a reason why it's the most expensive um, but even then with the provisions being so low it's still justified because it's very very strong just that ability to stop your opponent doing what they're trying to do just incredibly good uh, so this is this is lined pockets um, and land pockets, I think, is like E plus, uh, purely because like your crime cards, the coins you get from them really aren't that beneficial. Like one, one coin is not really enough, and like the the actives like very subpar. Like it's you're basically getting a few coins, and kind of what we've seen in general is that crime cards work really well in like a close to unitless list and. You're typically not so to so probably explain this quite badly but to get the best value out of this leader really you need to play a lot of crimes now in general the crimes really aren't generating coins and if you're running a lot of crimes then the amount of spenders that you're going to have is like quite low because then you're really filling up your deck with like chaff when you really need to be getting the value out um because you lose half your coins after uh, at the end of the turn, it means your coins that you're playing round one, 99% of the time result in no carryover through to round three. And yeah, you're just not getting too much value. When you compare that to something like uh, Nature's Gift, that's just when you play a Nature card, you get one point, one point on the board. Like no ifs, buts, whatever. Uh, coins are, they represent one point, but without a way to utilize them effectively it not always at uh, one point so yeah little little disappointing uh, so Mahakam Forge I think is a B um, although it doesn't see all that much play it provides quite a lot I think if the active wasn't just player tempering uh, it would maybe see a little more play and arguably if dwarves were a little stronger and were as I think it's just because there's so point slammy um, they're just a little lacklustre because there's better point slam options, I guess. Um, but armor's quite an interesting one because it synergizes with dwarves. So you think about like um, Xavier and like Zigrin and Berserkers, all sorts of things like that. Um, they benefit from having armor. But then you also have um, the added effect of like adding armor to cards. It sets up this weird sort of thing with removal because. You remove a 5 power unit, you're taking 5 points off the board. You, remo you remove a 4 power unit with 1 armor, still taking it off the board, but they're only losing 4 points instead. So what this means is your engines are a little less tempting to remove, and it doesn't feel as good to remove them. Um, it makes removal for your opponent less tempo, while you can sort of focus on developing your card to say, take things like a, like a Berserker for example. Berserker will have played for like eight points after five turns. And sure your opponent can, you know, hit that with like say like a nature's rebuke, take all the armor off, um, and deal like one damage. But then if you pass, you're not really that bothered because you know if you're passing early, um you were never gonna get that full value. So yeah, I really I really like um Hack and Forge. I think a bit more 
strong dwarf cards and you probably see this a lot more. Uh, so next we have Mobilization and it pains me to say it but it's F. Um, I really really liked Mobilization but the new version not that good. I mean I have been playing it a lot. I've been playing uh, the uh, Revenant sort of stuff, uh, Kedwani Revenants and using Mobilization for that but it's just very underwhelming. Like it's a reinforcement that spawns doesn't play. It makes you choose the row. It has to be a soldier, and the only sort of like benefit is you get plus two points. So it's just it is generally not good. It is pretty weak, uh, which is really disappointing. But is what it is. Uh, Mobilization's glory days will come back one day, I'm sure. Uh, so next we have onslaught. Which actually I completely forgot existed on the first run through and I had to uh, get the name back up again because it's so bad. <laughs> it is absolutely terrible. Um, deal one damage with two cooldown. Awful. Like max value you're getting in a full round is five points and one damage really isn't doing that much. Like yes, yeah, Skellige benefits from damage but there's just better stuff and you just don't need this like one damage every two turns because it's just so irrelevant really uh sounds quite harsh on it but i would say it's arguably like if i'd have put a lower tier it would have gone down there uh so nature's gift it's an s uh so this is kind of because and when you compare it to things of similar sort of like effects so things like battle trance it seems kind of weird it being higher but it's a combination of a few things so for one nature cards are in general better than alchemy cards um two it synergizes even better with um nature cards than like battle trance does with alchemy cards so perfect example of this is nature's rebuke um nature's rebuke can just be five damage so it's basically an owls of thunder however when you're playing your nature card, you're getting these one power triumphs down, and then you use a nature's rebuke, and now there's a target for the death blur. And all of a sudden, without you needing to play a trion, your rebuke is now worth seven points. And that's just ridiculously good. And when there's so many cards that like are good cards that work with nature cards, like Forest Protector and Fov, it, it's just a beautiful combination. And then you have like the cherry on top of the fact that there's not only these like sort of low provision uh good nature cards so things like dryad's caress and um and like rebuke and like circle to some extent there's like good top end ones as well uh like we've seen like shaping nature is actually pretty good in most circumstances uh call the forest is an amazing tutor as in Grimm's council so there's definitely a lot of synergy and not to mention it just fits in nicely with you being able to play more uh, symbiosis if you want. You just play more symbiosis and you get even taller uh, treants. So, yeah, I don't think there's really any downside. I mean, you could argue the active is a bit underwhelming, but it's still six points on top of this really powerful passive effect. Like, I would even argue that if there was no active effect whatsoever, no uh, giving stuff... Uh, vitality it would probably see some play because the passive is that good uh, because there's just so much synergy there for it so now we got off the books which i think is in the same bracket that um line pockets is in that it's not really doing all that much like tribute cards being one less it's like okay but there's not many tribute cards that are really that amazing and like tribute costs aren't sort of the most breaking thing so like say things like um i don't know playing like um oh, i've forgotten his name adriana playing like adriana for example playing adriana where his tribute is five doesn't really feel all that different to playing adriana when his tribute's four like it's not a big enough payoff however if you look at like passiflora peaches passiflora peaches with horde of four feels kind of awkward to get to Passiflora Peaches with a horde of two, easy, easily done. Um, and it, yeah, it's kind of missing that thing that makes Hidden Cash great, which is 
it turns like okay cards into really good cards this just turns good cards into like marginally better and it's just yeah it's not it's just not good enough unfortunately uh so a woman hunger is like it's obviously on the cusp of s like it's definitely it's like a plus plus um don't think it's quite up there so my kind of thoughts on overwhelming hunger is like it's just insanely good um unfortunately monsters have the problem that they always have like lack of control very point slammy um yeah the monsters has a lot of issues but this video ain't about that um what this basically allows you to do is turn these death wish units that require a lot of setup to be getting immediate value so for example uh so like a card like maruna um maruna has a very very strong effect and is arguably the best death wish unit there is however you play it as a four your opponent uses like i don't know karate heat wave they lock it they do whatever to it it don't work so instead you have to have uh something like i've played like horn or you have a bar geist on the board or yeah just a way to consume it early on that requires so much setup instead you've just got a ability to trigger a death wish and gain two points what's not to like uh and there's kind of a reason why this is like apart from kel Tullis, the only real thing that you see monsters playing uh, so we have Pirate's Curve, which is just straight F, um, mainly because it's like it's it's like the pirate leader that doesn't synergize with pirates. Uh, playing a Sea Jackal just isn't that great. I mean, sure, it gives you a spender guaranteed, but yeah, Pirate's Curve is just not good. Uh, there's just no synergy there for it, and I don't really think I need to explain that all that much. Uh, so Patricidal Fury, um, I actually think is like it's borderline these two. I right, I'm for controversy's sake, I'll put it in C. So uh, it's it's like a eight point slam and like the bloodthirst synergy is really really nice, but it's just not doing all that much. Um because like you typically don't struggle all that much to get damaged units on the board and Yeah, it's just not really providing you with all that much. And I think the sort of counter argument to that would always be like, well, look at Skelligan out, like everyone's playing either Rage of the Sea or Patricidal Fury. But I think that's more because like Reckless Flurry is terrible, Ersin Ritual doesn't fit, Onslaught's garbage, uh Battle Trance doesn't synergize with it, and like some people play Blaze of Glory instead. Like I think the reason that Patricidal Fury sees so much play is because Skellig is very strong. I don't think Patricidal Fury sees a lot of play because Patricidal Fury is strong. Um, I think it's balance. I think I'm probably being harsh on it, but controversy for content, I guess, uh, maybe deserves B, but I think I'm going to give it a C because in my eyes it's, it's somewhat underwhelming. Uh, so we have uh, this Pincer Maneuver. Uh, new pincer maneuver is like an E, uh, mainly because it's not like the hand fixing is really really good. Uh, the hand fi fixing aspect I'm always a big fan of, which is kind of why I like tactical decision. Um, hand fixing is always great and being guaranteed to draw a card because Northern Realms is notorious for just being terrible when you miss that one key card. Um, it's really nice, but it's it's like super slow in terms of tempo because you're not really doing anything straight away and like the five point boost isn't all that great and especially when you consider if it isn't a unit you get so say you're playing siege um you're not getting any points out of it it's just straight up swapping it's basically a mulligan at that point uh, at least this is basically a mid like mid round mulligan that gives you five points and unfortunately that five points doesn't translate amazingly like you can put it on anseas for example and do a nine point jeweler but shield wall exists like six power with the shield jewels better than a nine power unit so there's no real reason to play a uh, pincer maneuver beyond the like guaranteed mulligan effect uh so next we have precision strike which again is like a c um 
this is kind of because i mean some very ingenious people like obviously specimen and everything have figured out that hang on a minute uh this works really well with shiru but without shiru like there's no real synergy um like broccolon sentinels really aren't that great of course it provides you thinning but if you want to use it for thinning like thinning's good in round one and like round two but there's next to no point in thinning in round three but you don't want to be committing your whole leader before round three so like it sets up a weird setup where you have thinning cards in your deck but you don't want to thin them out which yeah it just feels awful um and not to mention like it relies on a death blur if you consider the other thinning cards like uh, like volunteers which play for play for eight and all you need is another dwarf or like wild hunt riders all you need is dominance yeah it's just a little underwhelming um i think obviously shiru i love playing shiru so i'm probably a little biased like arguably this is maybe a little lower and as i'm talking about, i probably actually deserves a d uh but yeah it's, it's not providing a whole lot uh so then we have reckless flurry which like it's like c or d because probably d um i can't put it in the same category as patch saddle fury it represents the same amount of points i mean i actually mm, all right we'll go we'll go d but disrespect uh aren't off that much but uh, yeah, Reckless Furries is not good. It's like 8 points of random damage. Literally, that's it. Like, that's providing nothing for you. Um, obviously, you benefit from damaged units, but I would say, like, Reckless Furry wouldn't be that bad. I would arguably see play if it was, like, you choose the uh, targets. You, like, choose targets that take 1 damage, and it's sort of, like, applied wherever you choose. But because it's random, you know, this can just, if your opponent has any armor, this could just all hit armor, it could hit shields, um, it could, say, you, your opponent's got, like, um, I don't know, like, one damage unit on the board, and you've got champion's charge, and you use your leader ability as, like, a Hail Mary, you're like, I need to set up three damage units so my champion's charge will do its thing, and instead Reckless Flurry goes off, and it hits armor, and kills the one damage unit they had. You know what's that done for you it's done nothing uh so the random effect just makes this unplayable unfortunately uh so i have no idea why but the name of this is completely blanked but it's booster unit by one um every turn every turn every other turn and this is like a d um it's like much better than onslaught because nr just synergizes so much better with um buffed units more than Skelliger does from like damaging a unit um so this is kind of because if you think like Dunban is really good Tridom's really good uh being able to buff an Anna is really good there's just tons of tons of units that benefit from Inspired and the fact that all you need is one point of boost to make Inspired work when you compare to like Bloodthirst abilities that require multiple damaged units in effect you can start an Inspired effect going with one charge of your leader and your opponent can't play around it while onslaught say may require you to set up like three three units that are damaged which is just gonna take you six turns for example with your leader alone so rage of the sea uh last patch rage of the sea would have been s i think now it's like a uh so my kind of reasoning for this is now it's much more of a commitment kind of thing uh like charge leaders are pretty good because you can spread out uh when you use them but now it feels like a little bit more of a commitment uh with just two charges now it deals a lot of damage because basically what it represents is putting down like eight damage and it also spawns you four points which is basically a reckless flurry that you have some level of control over and you can split up and it also gives you four points guaranteed uh objectively a better version of this um i think the change was pretty good um because it didn't lose any points but it made it a lot more committal to use it um and i think it's like really really good for skelliger because tempo can be sometimes a little hard for skelliger to find but having this sort of setup of points um 
provides a lot of tempo that Skellig is sometimes missing quite a bit. So yeah, I think this is a very strong leader. Uh, so now we have Stockpile, which pains me to say, but is like an E. And this is kind of because, yeah, you have like the incredible combo of Dandelion, Priscilla, Bizagota, just pinging off each other, giving charges, all this sort of stuff. But outside of that, the charge units for an R just are, are really that amazing. You've got like Redanian Archer, which converts a charge into a point, and it's it's like okay. But really, you're looking at a setup of without something like without a dandelion on the board. Basically, one charge is a little underwhelming. Um, I think it's mainly that that the value of charges really isn't that high, and it does require a level of setup. Um, the other leader leader abilities don't really require. Uh, so I don't think this one's a surprise. Shield walls an S. Like, do I even need to talk about it? It makes jewels amazing. It makes engines unkillable. It's two points in a shield. It's just ridiculous. Uh, probably been a bit OTT on it, but yeah, shield wall, no surprise there. Very, very strong. Uh, tactical decision, I think is like a C. Um, mainly because much like how double crosses um it's providing you quite a bit of like hand fixing it basically gives you like three more mulligans like mid game and a six point body which is really really good and the benefit of being able to choose where the cards go allows you to benefit from cards like Joachim um obviously works like Afan does with um Imperial Formation and yeah I, I really like Tactical Decision mainly because of that like non-point related um advantage that you're getting from it uh so uprising i think uprising still less i think because nr very very easily set up uh green health units because you have cards like uh reynard you've got drummers you've got anna um you've got varaxis you've got visor uh all of these things that are just giving boost left right and center um and then not only can you set up even more green health units, and since you benefit from Inspired as well, it's just very easy to do. And then it just adds a bomb at the end. Like you then get a massive bomb that gives you a payoff for having these green health units. And I think the only reason that we don't see Uprising all that much at the moment is because Shield Wall's just better. Um, I think like if I'd have put it on, like kind of Shield Wall would be in like S plus and Uprising would be S, but that definitely doesn't take away from how good Uprising is. So, SM Ritual. SM Ritual is like a C, um, mainly because Skelliger has quite a few nice ways to convert you losing points into like a positive gain in points. Uh, so with things like Armored Drakkar and like Draco Turtle, um, even like things like um, I always forget which clan it is. I think it's Tersich Veteran or something. Uh, the one that has the Berserk 2 or 3 and it heals itself back to 8. But basically, Skellige has a lot of ways to benefit. Um, and they're like the less used ones. Uh, there's obviously the obvious ones like Ceres and like Vilkal are really, really good with it. And yeah, Skellige kind of has ways to transition those points. The only downside is you need these very specific cards for SR Ritual to be anything but a one point leader and yeah it's just not all that great um yeah i don't think there's much more to add to that beyond like it's not it's not providing a huge lot um especially because it's only five charges you kind of can't rely on it for like this whole like self-damaging archetype you'd need other cards so instead it more acts as a activate a four cards like Ceres and Vilkal for example uh, so yeah I think it's like kind of in that region of it's good but it's not amazing at the job it's meant to do basically and then finally we have White Frost which is like like an E plus I guess um, mainly because we've kind of seen like Frost isn't very good um, because your opponent has so many ways to play around it it's super slow at best it's like two point um a two point engine and the row movement it's not all that relevant um really not all that relevant 
I don't think there's much to say beyond that. I think we've just all kind of seen that Frost is very disappointing and it's just way too slow. Just way, way too slow. And the support for this archetype isn't good enough, quite simply. Um, and I think I've talked for far long enough. <laughs> uh, that's that's a lot to cover. So, yeah, as I say, um, I think I'm pretty sure that people will definitely disagree with me on some of this and tear my ideas and my arguments to pieces, and I fully welcome that. Uh, so I'm more than looking forward to comments saying how, how wrong I am. Um, and as I say, I will post um, a link to uh, this tier list. I went through the painstaking process of getting all the um, leader ability images and like setting up this tier list. So this should be accessible. You should be able to just go on um, and yeah, it'll be set up like this and you can drag them on where you want. So you're more than welcome to do this yourself. Show me yours. Uh, any arguments you have, anything like that. So yeah, I'll leave it at that because this video has probably gone on longer than it needs to. Uh, so thank you for watching. If you've got to this point, congratulations because I've been talking forever and I will catch you in the next one.